Tonight, we're going to talk about these mainstream nutritional myths that have been completely debunked by science. And tonight, what we're going to go over is I'm going to share with you sound scientific proof, show you the journal article, show you quotes of each myth, basically exposing these myths so you guys can actually use the scientific arsenal at your disposal. So anytime tries to tell you something different, you've got backup here. So feel free to use this video because you're going to have all the evidence here. And a couple quotes to start off with is that it is easier to believe a lie that one has heard a thousand times than to believe a fact that no one has heard before. And the second one, Adolf Hitler did this one. It's an extreme example, but it's the same thing that's going on in nutritional myths here. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. And that's exactly how these nutritional myths have started. And every one of you are gonna know what I'm talking about. You're gonna hear these things. You may even believe some of these myths here. And I do expose all these myths and talk about general nutrition in my new book I just put out on Amazon. And it will be about available here in a couple weeks, but uh, I do go over all of that. Worked really hard on it, so uh, if you guys ever wanna check it out and review it, uh, I'd be greatly appreciative of that. And myth number one that we're gonna talk about today is the healthiest diet is a low-fat, high-carb diet with lots of grains. That's the number one myth we wanna talk about. And you know, even in, this, you know, this journal article here. JAMA is one of the best journals. It's the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what they did is that, you know, if this is the healthiest diet, then it should do a couple things. It should prevent us from cancer, and it should prevent us from cardiovascular disease, you know, the top couple killers in the US today. So it should be able to do that. So when you're looking at just a low-fat, high-carb diet in regards to cardiovascular disease, what you're going to see, and I'll blow this up for you, is that there is no evidence. You know, it did not reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease, having a high-carb, low-fat diet. And we go on to say even more is that this one looks at basically a low-fat, high-carb diet with cancer risk. So does it lower cancer? And again, they're finding the same stuff that it does not lower cancer. So people that do a high-fat diet, low-carb diet, they're not they're not looking at, you're not looking, you're not seeing these long-term improvements in chronic disease, in, in health. And so the summary for this one is that numerous studies have been done on this low-fat, high-carb diet, and it has no effect on body weight or disease risk in the long term. So then we got the food guide pyramid, and you got to look at the top two areas, the top two extremes, because what they tell you to eat is 6 to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. And that's what they're telling you to eat the majority part of your diet. And this is absolutely the recipe for health disaster. I mean, you're talking insulin resistance, every chronic disease. So if you want to be sick, do this diet. But on the contrary, on the very top, they say fats used sparingly. So what you really want to do is you want to flip this over. The bottom section should be healthy vegetables and healthy fats followed by healthy fruits, healthy protein intake. And then if you choose to eat dairy, make sure it's uh, ideally organic and raw. That'd be perfect. And that is the recipe for successful health right there. And so myth number two, and everyone's heard this one, you need to restrict your salt intake in order to lower your blood pressure and prevent heart attack and stroke. Has everyone not heard that before? Oh, this has too much sodium, you know, sodium, sodium. So let's look at what the science says, shall we? because the science says a completely different thing. You know, this one here out of the Cochrane database in dietary salt in preventing heart disease. And what you're gonna see is again, it's the same things over and over, insufficient evidence. And these are systematic reviews where they review all of the literature. There's no evidence. Insufficient evidence that reduced salt intake on uh, has any improvement on mortality. Because in the end, of the, the end of the day, do we really care that lowering salt to a very low level might have a modest decrease in blood pressure? Or do, would we rather care about, does that decrease in blood pressure have us live, make us live longer, make us healthier? Because these values don't mean anything. If they show that, oh, your systolic blood pressure went down two millimeters mercury, does that mean anything if you still are gonna die the same age and still be just as sick, if not more sick? I mean, it doesn't matter. And so that's what they're finding out because I care about what it's doing long term. And in long term, it has no, has no impact on mortality. And so here, insufficient evidence again. So I love this because 
Here, they took the opposite stance because they're finding over and over again that they can't figure out lowering sodium intake does not allow for more health. So here, in the conclusion, they finally say, further evidence is needed to confirm whether restriction of sodium is harmful for people. So now they're taking the opposite path, that maybe we need to reevaluate this and find out if lowering this is actually uh, <laughs> harmful for people and their health. And then I like this. Our estimates of benefits, that means that their belief that the benefit is from salt restriction is based on the small blood pressure reduction. So they documented that if you severely lower someone's sodium intake, you may have a small reduction in blood pressure, but that's it. It's not gonna make you live longer and not gonna make you healthier. That's all they can prove. So again, in summary, despite moderately lowering blood pressure, and that's only in some people, they're still reducing this does not reduce the risk of heart attacks. And the problem is that in 1997, because you might be wondering, what, why did we start to even demonize salt in the first place? And it happened in 1997, this DASH study, they did a study, and what they did is they had a population eat a whole food diet. So healthy fruits, vegetables, healthy protein, and so they were just eating whole foods. Now obviously, if you eat a whole food diet, you're gonna have less sodium intake than the average American because 75% of your salt intake is coming from processed foods. But what they did not mention is that it's also drastically lower in fructose levels. But they only, they took it as, when they saw these benefits, and they saw this reduction in blood pressure off people eating a whole food diet, they, they, they uh, wanted to contribute all that benefit to the lower amount of salt. But in reality, it's the lower amount of fructose, your processed refined sugars, that got them all the benefits in the first place. Because again, fructose directly leads to insulin resistance. And once you're insulin resistant, you're going to be at high risk of virtually all chronic diseases out there. And again, refined carbs. So anytime you eat a carb, especially refined fructose, it's going to increase massively your insulin response. And if you do that over time, you're going to get this thing called insulin resistance, causing your blood pressure to raise, causing you to store more fat in the midsection, causing obesity, heart disease, everything. And again, a byproduct of fructose metabolism is uric acid. And uric acid directly increases blood pressure. So the fructose was the culprit the entire time. However, the, you know, whoever did the study, they, did, they took the opposite stance and they blamed it all on the reduced sodium intake. And that's how the whole rumor started, all just from 1997, one single study. And so here, what happens if you actually lower your salt intake too low. Because people are doing this all the time now in fear of any type of illness. And so there's three studies here, and you gotta look at this, this last one. The Journal of American Medical Association. They took 3,600 or almost 3,700 middle-aged healthy Europeans, and they studied them for eight years. And they put them in three groups. A low salt group, a moderate salt group, and a high salt group. Well, in the low salt group, 50 people died. And in the high salt group, 10 people died. So that's five times more deaths in the low salt group compared to the high salt group. And they had, the researchers had no other conclusion to base this on, but they had to say it. So they said the risk for heart disease was 56% higher for the low salt group. And they went on to say the less salt you eat, the more likely you will die from heart disease. So completely opposite of what we've heard. Myth number two, completely exposed. But this is what low salt intake is linked to. Elevated cholesterol, the harmful cholesterol, heart disease, heart failure, insulin resistance, diabetes, osteoporosis. You're more than three times likely to get bone fractures if you have low salt intake. So that's not the answer, but this is the answer because it matters what kind of salt it is. And that original study never even differentiated. All these studies, they're looking at table salt. It's like, hello, that's not even natural salt. And this breaks it down for you. Real salt is like your Himalayan salt, salt found naturally on earth, your Celtic salt, sea salt. And when you break down the nutrient profile, 84% of real natural salt is sodium chloride. And the other 16% is these vital trace minerals that are absolutely you know, essential for human health. This Morton salt, I'm just gonna call it crappy salt, it's easier. <laughs> crappy salt, Instead of 84% sodium chloride, it's 98% sodium chloride. So then you're thinking maybe, oh, well, maybe the other 2% is uh, healthy minerals. 
No, it's man-made chemicals and moisture absorbance. So that's the kind of crap we're talking about here. So I'm not saying you need to have a high amount of salt, a low amount of salt. We need to eat normal amounts of real salt and you're going to be good. I mean, it's that simple. And they got iodine in there, yeah. Well, our table salt now does not have iodine. It's too expensive now. Now it's more, they use a more uh, bromide now. Which is even worse. Yes. So myth number three, it is best to eat many small meals throughout the day to increase your metabolism. And we've all heard this, you know, most people say, oh, six small meals a day. And their theory, again, is if we eat constantly throughout the day, we keep our metabolism at its highest and we're avoiding something called starvation mode, which is where your metabolism drops and basically wants to hold on to every calorie and not burn anything. So that's a theory behind this myth. So let's look at the first line of evidence that let's compare many small meals throughout the day versus like two or three larger meals. And there's been studies done on this. Wow, who would have thought? These nutritionists do not know their own research. So, meal frequency and energy balance. And here's a list of quotes. We conclude that the evidence at best is very weak. At best, it's very weak, you know. Metabolic advantage of nibbling meal patterns failed to reveal benefits. There's no difference between nibbling and gorging. In this study, nibbling was eating six small meals out of the day. Gorging was two or three bigger meals. But again, you're going to find this on no evidence, no evidence, no difference, yada, yada, yada. So again, we conclude that increasing meal frequency does not promote greater body weight loss. I mean, this is just what the science says. So I don't know where they got this theory, but it's not true. Now, let's look at this thing called uh, intermittent fasting. Because if you actually take a little break off eating and you don't eat for a little bit, maybe uh, at the most one day, but say you even eat and don't eat for about 16 hours out of the day, what you're gonna, what's going to show is that energy expenditure increased significantly. They call intermittent fasting here short-term starvation, where it's really just not eating 16 out of the 24 hours in the day, which is not really starvation, but that's what they call it here. <coughs> but it, your energy expenditure, your metabolism, your metabolic rate increases significantly when you actually don't give your body all this food all the time. So it's the complete opposite of what everybody thinks. And so here, eating small meals throughout the day to keep your metabolism up is a complete myth because your metabolic rate is actually increased short term after fasting. So this starvation mode theory, because we got to talk about this too, it turns out that it actually does exist, the starvation mode. The problem though, it does not occur, you know, four to six hours from not eating. <coughs> it occurs after three to four days after not eating. Now that's a big difference. You know, three to four, you know, four to six hours versus three to four days. Huge difference there. And so if we know our body does this, if we know our metabolism tanks after three to four days after not eating, the next question is because our bodies are built very, very intelligently. And there's always a reason behind everything. Everything that we do physiologically, there's a reason for. So just think, why would, if we don't eat temporarily for the first two to one to two days, why would our metabolism spike and allow us to have increased energy and increased metabolism, but after three to four days, it drop. Does anyone have a guess? So you have enough energy to go out and get some food. Exactly, exactly. You've got to think of the hunter-gatherer population. Now, what happens is that they're not eating for three to four days, these guys. Sometimes these hunting trips they used to go on would last two, three, four days. That was very common. You know, it's not like they're looking at a, just a little pool of fish that was just easy to hunt. No, this was hard work. So, short term, the increase in stress hormones, the, sh the sharpening of the mind and this energy spike, that's absolutely going to help these guys get their energy from food to effectively hunt and kill their prey. Absolutely. But then, after 48 to 72 hours, say these guys were going out there and after three to four days, they were getting nothing. Well, now that increase in meta metabolic rate, if it stayed increased, they're going to starve to death because they're gonna have no food in the system. So your body intelligently will now drop your metabolic rate so you can spare and you know, basically uh, decrease the likelihood of starvation. So absolutely important, very intelligent, and that's just what the science shows. Myth number four, avoid egg yolks. You know, 
because of the increase in cholesterol. And I love that word cholesterol. It sounds so scary, you know, cholesterol. But eggs have been demonized. People are eating so many egg whites always, all the time. I want the egg white omelet. And it's like, do you really know what you're doing? Like, do they not realize that all the nutrition is in the yolk itself? But again, let's just look at the science. It's always easy. Now here, the, this is titled Rethinking Dietary Cholesterol. And what they found is that dietary cholesterol is not correlated with increased risk of coronary heart disease. And that's the whole thing why cholesterol is demonized in the first place, because it increases the likelihood of heart disease, supposedly, but it really doesn't. And again, I love the bottom part. The recommendations limiting dietary cholesterol should be reconsidered. And this is in their own journals, in their conclusion. <coughs> so here, this actually looked at a study done directly on eating eggs. And what they found is that the lack of connection between heart disease and egg intake could partially be explained by the fact that dietary cholesterol can increase temporarily both your LDL and HDL. So what they're saying is that there's no connection between the increase in cholesterol you're eating from the eggs and your risk of heart disease because you're increasing both your healthy and your unhealthy cholesterol temporarily, not in everybody, but some people. And so that means if you increase both, the ratio is still gonna stay the same. And that's really the important factor. And then here, there's no risk in developing coronary heart disease by increasing your intake of cholesterol. But in contrast, there's actually multiple beneficial effects by the inclusion of eggs. So now they take the opposite stance in their conclusion that it's actually beneficial. So eggs are absolutely important. They're one of the most nutritionist foods on the planet. You gotta eat the yolks. That's where the, most of the nutrients are found. But also too, despite them being high in cholesterol, they don't raise blood cholesterol in healthy individuals. It just doesn't happen. And that's why too, again, they took out the recommendations for limiting cholesterol in the food guide pyramid now. They now, the US dietary guidelines, they don't put any restrictions on dietary cholesterol. And this happened since 2015. They no longer do it. So science finally <coughs> caught on to what everyone's been proving all along. But you know, at least they did it. Better late than never. And you obviously can't finish the egg section without a little egg trivia. I mean, that, that's stupid. So, what, which one of these three eggs is a healthy egg from a healthy chicken, pasture chicken? One, three, three, three. 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 I, hear, I hear twos and threes and one, one. Well, I'm glad that uh, you guys are overwhelmingly mostly all wrong, but it's number one. Yes. Yes, you want that dark, that kind of really like deep orange color of a yolk. That signifies that the chicken is healthy, grass-fed, pasture-raised. Uh, you, you're not going to get them at Costco and Albertsons. Yeah, so you, you, you know, it, it's hard to find. There's different places. Sometimes you can find a, uh, you know, pastured, organic things at like Whole Foods, uh, Mother's Fermentation Farm. You know, where you, or if you have a connection straight from a farm. Yeah, neighbor. But, but this is, this is true. And so here again, this is a like a little less extreme of an example, but you still see the pastured egg, it's that slightly dark yolk flavor. If the yolk looks slightly pale, it's not good. And that's mostly what you're going to find at the supermarkets, you know, any conventional area you go to. Wow. And this is why it's so important because organic pastured chicken eggs versus a commercial egg you're talking two times the amount of omega-3s, seven times more pro-vitamin A, three times more vitamin E, six times more vitamin D, and way more antioxidants, lutein, and zeaxanthin. So they're not made equal. I mean, I'd rather have one of those good <coughs> eggs than four of the crappy eggs, because I mean, the nutrient profile, this is actually what we're made to eat. You know, not the stuff where they're done in factories and whatever's going on there. So again, like I described, U.S. dietary guidelines, they used to describe these cholesterol-rich foods as foods and food components that you need to reduce. They used to give out these things, and they used to say that you should only eat 300 milligrams or less of dietary cholesterol. Well, that means you can't even barely have one egg a day if you're going by these rules. But then again, 
mounting evidence shows that had very, very low uh, correlation with the actual cholesterol level in your body. Because we're going to find out that's mostly due to fructose, processed sugar, and harmful, stressful, destructive environments. Not your dietary cholesterol. But now, since 2015, they finally removed the dietary restrictions on cholesterol. So basically they're saying, you know, we were proven wrong. All the science shows that eggs and cholesterol is actually not increasing your blood cholesterol like that. So you got us. And there you go. And then once they took out those recommendations, I love this quote. Cleveland Clinic cardiologist Dr. Stephen Neeson told the USA Today, it's the right decision. We got the dietary guidelines wrong. And this is really refreshing. They've been wrong for decades. And that's, this is not the only thing they've been wrong on, but... At least he admits it on this one. So, myth number five is saturated fat. All about saturated fat and how it supposedly raises your LDL cholesterol in the blood, increasing risk of heart attacks. And this is actually the corner, cornerstone of what we've been taught to believe. Saturated fat, bad, bad, bad. Even cholesterol is bad. But again, it's not true. And so, let's just look at the science. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and they showed, they looked at saturated fat and the correlation with cardiovascular disease. And a uh, common theme, there's no evidence. And again, let's check it out again on this one. And again, reduction has been shown no benefit. And there were no clear effects of dietary fat changes on total mortality. So if they can't even prove that you live longer or get healthier, what the heck would you want to do it for? Because they can't prove any of this stuff. No clear health benefits from replacing saturated fats with starchy foods. Okay, we already went over the low-fat, high-carb diet. So we already know that's not working. So obviously, if you replace your healthy saturated fats with more grains and starchy foods, that's obviously not going to be good either. This one, despite not finding any correlation with anything, these guys who did the study still had the audacity to put this in their conclusion. Lifestyle advice to all those at risk of cardiovascular disease and to lower risk, you should continue to include permanent reduction of dietary saturated fat. Even though we found no evidence that it increases health, no evidence that it increases morbidity, nothing, we're still gonna say it should be permanently reduced. I mean, this is just crazy. And so, kind of like how the whole salt myth started in the first place in 1997, well, the saturated fat myth has been started all the way in the early 1950s. And it's by this scientific fraud named Ansel Keys. And this guy's a, a PhD. In 1953, he had this hypothesis. Think, you know, and his hypothesis was, his educated guess was, more saturated fat leads to more heart disease. And then he, all of a sudden, he, got, he wanted to do a study, and he took this very abundant data from 22 different countries. And he compiled their data, their saturated fat intake, and their risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the study he did is called the Seven Countries Study. But wait, I thought he took data from 22 different countries. So why would it be called the Seven Countries Study? Well, the reason is, is because 15 of, the 15 of the 22 countries didn't support his hypothesis. <laughs> so he committed scientific fraud, kind of like what you've seen on vaccine industries. They destroyed the evidence, they got rid of the evidence, and they only used the seven countries that supported his hypothesis. Wow. And so, and you know, and things, you know, studies excluded, like from France, where they have high saturated fat intake, but very low levels of cardiovascular disease. They just excluded those countries, and they just call it the seven country study. So here is all the plotted points there. And what you're gonna see is on the horizontal axis is the amount of saturated fat. On the vertical is the amount of heart disease. So you can see these, <laughs> I like how they call them outliers, but the red dots on the right, basically those are countries that have an extreme high amount of saturated fat and virtually no heart disease whatsoever. You know, but you're gonna see it's kind of just like a scattered, messed up plot. But when you use his seven countries, you're gonna see a linear correlation. The more saturated fat equals the more heart disease. You know, and that looks pretty sound to me. I'd be like, oh wow, this is, might not be so good. But then, let's plot some more graphs using different countries, shall we? Oh, 
Well, this one shows a negative correlation for the amount of saturated fat in the heart disease, just depending on what countries you choose from. There's another one, same, negative correlation. The more saturated fat, the less heart disease. So again, he only took, and you know, you're wondering what kind of, you know, uh, what kind of industries were in this guy's pockets to even do this fraud and come up with this study? Because ever since this study, saturated fat has been absolutely demonized for everybody. And you know, honestly, it still is. Because people don't know the research. And so, that's that. Now, next month, I'm gonna do a myth part two. And some of the topics we're going to be discussing is whole grains, coffee, you know, all calories being equal. We're going to talk about red meat consumption, um, more in detail on sugar, refined vegetable oils, and we're also going to talk about um, just the fact that we're going to lower cholesterol and that makes us healthy. So we're going to talk about the other part two, part of the myths, and we're going to expose those as well. But once this goes on YouTube, I mean, anyone arguing with this, you just show them this and they're going to shut up because they have to. So, thank you guys, appreciate it. Here's a list of references. Any questions? Oh, were there any medical journal articles mm -hmm. that supported the myths in the first place? Well, again, like that 97 DASH study, when you're looking at good evidence, you, it's not necessarily just finding it in the journal, but it's also finding the authors of not having any financial interests in the thing that they're supporting. Because if I have an invested interest in showing that my product works, I'm gonna do whatever I can, and that's shown all the time. But honestly, they're all like that. They're all, there's no significant evidence. There's not a whole lot of evidence there, but they're just taking the opposite stance because that's where the profits are. So the debt is corrupted. It, it, very, very corrupted. But this is, you know, it's not just on food. It's on mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Yeah, what's the, uh, if a person wants to lose about 10 to 15 pounds, they just feel a lot better, lighter, uh, what's the best diet to go on? Um, a whole food diet. Whole food? Whole food. Like eating real foods. So kind of like that food guide pyramid, healthy fats and healthy vegetables, the majority of it. Then you're talking about healthy proteins. And again, your protein, I'm a fan of animal protein if it's healthy. And you're t so not just, I don't just look for organic, I look for grass fed. They're, they're different. They're what? They're different. Yeah, organic does not mean grass fed. Grass -fed. So I look for both of those. And uh, I'm also looking at healthy fruits, you know. So basically avoiding things out of a package, oftentimes is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And also intermittent fasting. So using that, but eating it in an intermittent fasting way, that's the best bet and it's what we're made for. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. What's the best food to break your fast with on intermittent fasting? Um, it depends, like if you're breaking your fast in a uh, exercise regimen, you know, because I personally break it right after I work out. Okay. Um, so there you would, ha you would want your majority of calories being a high quality grass-fed whey protein. Concentrate, not isolate. But I mean, in general, I would say, Anything except excessive fruits. Just to break your fast, because the fruits do have fructose, and I would rather give myself more um, a, a, a protein or a vegetable. But again, combining all of those is fine. Okay. I just said personally, I wouldn't go right for the sugar. Yeah. I would go more for like the real food that provides uh, satiety. Yeah. Uh, about packaging, we have trouble uh, finding food that's not farm-raised and stuff. Is is it a requirement to label all food if it's farm-raised meats, I should say? Do you know if um, Well, if your meat doesn't have a um, organic label, I mean, some people, in order, that organic label is going to be your best fit. Even though there's still some issues even with that label in itself now, it's still way better than your opposite because if it doesn't have that, it's almost guaranteed to have you know, uh, recumbent bovine growth hormone. It's almost guaranteed to have antibiotics, super lace. And again, the antibiotics, and then in turn, will destroy your gut flora, impact digestion, health, everything. So it can be, ch it can be challenging sometimes, especially in the times we live in. You know, so meat is not necessarily good for you. Healthy meat is good for you. So it's always a distinction that you gotta be placing on a lot of these things, because going to Albertsons and buying just a general steak, like, is not, 
going to be healthy in most cases. So, yeah. Yeah. Like you mentioned, the way isolate would not be a good choice. Why is that? Um, I would say it's not necessarily a bad choice, but I would prefer concentrate because in isolate versions of protein, they're going through a little bit more of a uh, processing and they're denaturing a lot of the healthy immunoglobulins that whey protein has in itself naturally that actually boost human health in your immune system. Isolate is just a little bit more processed in a lab. And when you're breaking out all these uh, proteins and isolating them, which is kind of what, what that term comes from, when it's isolated and not really all together like it's found in nature, I'm not a very big fan of. So you're getting kind of like the real whole food thing there. Do you have any recommendations for <coughs> percentage, like 25% meat? Yeah, I mean, like percentages, I mean, you can go by that food guide pyramid. I mean, at a meal, it's 25% meat and some Well, proportion, like, are you talking about just proportion, like on your plate? Yeah. Or, because that's tough, because some things are more calorie dense than others. <laughs> you know, it's that, that, that's tough. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have anywhere from 50, I'll say just even lower down, 45 to 70% fat, and then around, you know, 20 and 20 protein and, uh, healthy carbs from like fruits and vegetables I mean you could that would be a good start but making your proportions kind of like a like this video or this uh, right here. like utilizing just kind of eating in proportion to that will kind of give you a good start so if you're talking about proportion on your plate make most of your plate the bottom section but again this remember we're flipping the bottom and the top category. So healthy fats, vegetables on the bottom, uh, bread, cereals, grains, pastas on the top. Can you give us some ideas of healthy fats? Yeah. Uh, nut seeds, avocados, eggs, um, grass-fed butter, okay. uh, raw dairy, coconut oil, avocado oil, avocados. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but again, too, like if you get a really good grass-fed steak, that's going to have both fat and protein. So some of these foods are you're you're getting both. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've, I used to be a carnivore, and I'm mostly plant-based now. Mm -hmm. And I find when I eat meat, even quality meat, it's hard to digest. I get lethargic, and mm -hmm. uh, it just takes me a long time to recover. Mm -hmm. Where you get that high intensity energy level uh, yeah. you know, like after a after a fast yeah so um, it, it's i guess it depends on the individual it's just the i mean it, it it does you know like most people who go you know vegetarian it's true they actually do get healthier and the reason is because they go from eating crappy meat to going vegetarian because again it's hard to find healthy meat you know i have to go out of my way and spend way more out of my pocket mm. to get the healthy stuff but people, when you're going from like crappy toxic meat to a vegetarian diet, they actually get healthier because they're not getting that antibiotics all day, every day. They're not getting the growth hormones, all those fake hormones that are disrupting, uh, you know, erupting havoc in the body. They're not getting all that stuff. So I do think it's better than going conventional, but I also do think it's hard to argue that we weren't meant as a human species to have meat. You know, we have incisor teeth made in our body to shred meat you know so there's we it's it's hard to say i i do think that we were made to have that but it is harder and i do still think you can have a healthy you know vegan vegetarian lifestyle if you supplement with some things some of it yeah but i mean the true carnivore's digestive system is very different yeah. from the human digestive system so but then too like if you go on a break from eating dairy and then you introduce it again some people kind of lose that lactase enzyme and they kind of lose that ability to digest milk again. Yeah. So, you know, it could be, you're using different enzymes breaking down meats too. Yeah, I, I think it's toxins. In yeah. I, I, I love pasta and I get sick when I eat it here, but if I go to Italy, I can eat mm -hmm. pasta with no problems. Yeah. So yeah. I found that you get the actual ancient grains from a company in Montana and you make your own and, and you yeah. have no issue with it. And that's absolutely right because I mean, anywhere in Europe, France, you even get a baguette and it's hard as rock by the end of the day. Yeah. You know, so their foods don't have preservatives and all this other crap that we have, and their stuff goes bad. Yeah. yeah. That's, why That's why people go to the grocery stores every day yeah. <laughs> yeah, in Europe, yeah. which is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. So. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you go out to eat, you, you don't really eat meat because it's not organic. Like it's tough. Like they do have a, there is some like better restaurants for that than others. And also too, if you're getting like seafood dish, always ask the waiter, is it, is it a wild caught? Yeah, for the seafood, but for steak. Yeah, but you can ask them like where they produced it, but also too, there's some places where everything is clean, but you have to look oh, for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it, it's hard. Yeah. No one said it's going to be easy. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to eat healthy than all of a sudden to have a huge health crisis and then you're out of options. All right. If you have any other questions, come ask me personally. But thanks, guys, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.